Welcome back, Warrior. Happy Easter week. So, today we are on Tuesday of, um, of our Easter week, even though, um, even though today is actually Monday, but that's okay. Um, but I did want to give you like the, <clears throat> what's it called? The rundown of each of the days. Um, I downloaded this awesome printable from Redheaded Hostess and it outlines your whole Easter week. So we got Palm Sunday, we have Monday, the cleansing of the temple. Then we have Tuesday, um, teachings of Jesus Christ. Then we have Wednesday, the greatest commandments. And they just broke it up for us so that we don't have to think about it. I love that. That's why I go to the gym to go to the classes because then I don't have to think about it. Okay, sometimes my decision fatigue is really bad and so it's nice when people can put it out all organized for me, right? So then Thursday, his sacrifice begins. Then Friday, the crucifixion or Good Friday. And then Saturday, the tomb. And then Easter Sunday, his resurrection. So I think it's such an amazing principle. I'm going to cut these out and I'm gonna hang them up on my window just kind of as a reminder of what each day is um, in Relief Society this past uh, Sunday, we talked about how we can make Easter more like Christmas. And we talked about certain things and uh, talked about how we could watch uh, the Lamb of God like I was re recommending to you. Um, it's, it's called The Lamb of God Concert Film by Rob Gardner. So go watch that one. I'll put a link in that one. Um, Gardner, um, and then I know I said that I was going to put a link on, on the Sunday one and I forgot, so I'm sorry, um, but I will make sure I include it in this one. And then, um, we talked about things that we could do and we were thinking maybe like some craft activities or painting or we could um, have a special dinner. We talked about, um, my husband and I talked about how on Wednesday is like the day that we are available or maybe, was it Wednesday or Tuesday? Now I can't remember because now it feels like Wednesday is not a day that's available. <laughs> anyway, we talked about one of these days we could do like a charcuterie style uh, dinner where we sit on the floor and we talk about Jesus Christ and we kind of have that same similar foods that Christ had at, um, at the time. Or if it's not the same, you know, like charcuterie is delicious. So that's fine too. But everything's like whole food, right? Nothing like processed. Um, and then except maybe the dessert because, you know, <laughs> we might have to have a cake. Right? Didn't they call? They, didn't they have cakes? I probably not the cake that I'm thinking of is the kind that they had. But <laughs> chocolate cake is amazing. Anyway, um, then another thing that you could do is read the Living Christ. Um, you could. Uh, we we have this um, tulip garden over here at Thanksgiving Point, and they have these amazing bronze statues of Jesus Christ. I mean, they're like beyond life size. They're just gorgeous. And um, we've walked through the garden before and it's just awesome. And I was thinking we could do that this week. However, I guess they don't open until after Easter. So we'll just have to save that activity for after. But then we started talking about how, what if we try and do too many things? Then it really does feel like Christmas. And I mean, I don't know about you, but my Christmases feel super overwhelming. I never get any sleep and <laughs> I get sick <laughs> and what else? Um, and I feel, you know, anxiety about the next event that we have and I never feel like I can breathe. And, um, and then there's Christmas. <laughs> I feel like it's... It's not something that I want to translate into any other season of my life. In fact, I'm still trying to bring it down a notch on Christmas. Um, I keep trying to convince my family, like, can we go on a cruise for Christmas so that we are, like, away from people? Not a cruise for Christmas as in, like, hey, on Christmas Day, we go on a cruise. No, no, because on Christmas Day, everything's fine now, right? I'm talking a Christmas cruise, like, like, a 14-day cruise before Christmas. 
and that'd be amazing. Anyway, I don't even know where we would go, but like, it doesn't matter. Like, that's the point. It's just like, I want to escape is what I want to do on Christmas because there's so many responsibilities and so many things. And do I get to think about Jesus Christ? Well, I think about how Jesus Christ was not hurrying about his ministry and throughout his days, he wasn't rushing around the way that I rush around. Um, so that's usually what I think about <laughs> and, and how I'm like, if I can't picture Christ rushing around, why am I doing it? And how can I undo that? How can I minimize that? Right. Anyway. So those are some of the things that we thought of. And so, you know, don't feel like you need to do everything for Easter to make it feel like Christmas. In fact, I don't want Easter to feel like Christmas. <laughs> I want Easter to feel special. I want Easter to feel calm. I want Easter to feel like I'm coming unto Jesus Christ and it, and it feels more like peace. And I almost want Christmas or I almost want Easter or before Easter to feel like the day after Christmas, right? Like isn't the day after Christmas so awesome? Like, I feel like the day after Christmas, you're just like, you get to enjoy your family, you get to um, have good food, you get to think about Christ and how he was born and then think about his life. And, but there's not any more of like the weight of all the like tons of prep, you know, snowballing into one day. So that's, that's what I want. I want Easter to feel like after Christmas. <laughs> relaxing and rejuvenating in like and feeling like the weight has come off because that is what Christ does for us he is literally telling us that we can yoke ourselves to him and then things will be made easy or light and that is what the day after Christmas feels like for me so anyways um so, so, so just to break it down one more time, I'm going to for sure hang these up so that we can think about Jesus Christ. We'll for sure do the charcuterie board because I think that that would be fun and relaxing. I don't think that would add stress. Um, I'll just place the order on the old uh, Walmart grocery app thing so that they can bring me my food so I don't have to actually figure that out at the store because I have so bad ADHD when I'm at the store. Anyway, and then um, there was this also this other printable that they that they had, and I was like, oh, that would be so cute to like um, do like the little playing things out um, and do like the storyboarding, something like that. So anyway, this is like not gonna be super heavy on that. So. Um, so Tuesday, this is what we're doing. Tuesday, we're reading Matthew chapter 21, verses 23 to 32. And it says, And when he was come into the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came unto him as he was teaching and said, By what authority dost thou these, dost thou these things? And who gave thee this authority? And Jesus answered and said unto them, I also will ask you one thing, which if ye tell me, I, and likewise, will tell you by what authority I do these things. Okay, so in, um, so really quick, it, Red Hood Hostess is kind of giving us a summary. She says, these chapters contain, so Matthew 21 and 23, chapters contain teachings of Jesus Christ in Jerusalem during the last week. We will only cover the Jewish leaders questioning Jesus' authority and the parable of the two sons. Here is the list of things that Jesus taught about in these chapters. Okay, so... Again, this is just what they outline for you to study, but you can study all kinds of different things, right? Um, so Matthew 21, 18 to 22, Jesus curses the fig tree. Then Matthew 21, 23 to 27, leaders questioning Jesus's authority. Then Matthew 21, 33 to 46, the parable of the wicked husbandman. Then Matthew 22, 1 to 14, the parable of the marriage of the king's son. In Matthew 22, 15 to 22, render unto Caesar, what is Caesar's? Um, Matthew 22, 34 to 40, two great commandments. And then Matthew 23, 1 to 39, avoid following blind guides. Okay, so um, 
let me read up unto, so I just read 23 and 24, so let's read 25 to 27, and then they have like another little um, summary. So the baptism of John, whence was it? From heaven or of men? Or, yeah, from heaven or of men? And they re reasoned with themselves, saying, if we shall say from heaven, he shall say unto us, why did ye not then believe him? But if we shall say of men, we fear the people, for all hold John as a prophet. <laughs> And they answered Jesus and said, we cannot tell. And he said unto them, neither tell I you by what authority I do these things. So this was Christ having a very calculated answer. And isn't it interesting that they were trying to have calculated answers as well? Because when people ask you things, you have to go back in your mind like, wait a minute. <laughs> what, is, what, what is the question here that's really being asked, right? And Christ was like the master at this. Uh, so he was setting them up the way that they're trying to set him up, right? And so then uh, it says, the Jewish leaders found Jesus in the temple as he was teaching. They had devised a question, hoping to trap Jesus. By what authority dost thou these things? The, these things could be all of the things that have just happened, the cleansing of the temple and the healings at the temple, for they were the temple gatekeepers, not Jesus. Even the triumphal entry. Who told Jesus he could enter as a king? If Jesus says that God gave him authority, then these chief priests could charge him with blasphemy. If he says that he gave himself authority, then that is not the Jewish order of things since all teachings and priesthood positions came through appointment. If he says another Jewish leader gave him authority, then they could disp dispute that since they were the Jewish leaders. <sighs> That's crazy. Jesus, understanding their method and purpose of these questions, tells them he will answer their question if they answer one of his. The baptism of John, meaning the ordinance that John performed on his, fellow, on his followers, by what authority did John baptize with? The Jewish leaders reasoned together not what they felt their true answer was, but what would get them their desired result. Ultimately, they realized that Jesus' question was well formulated, and their best answer was, we cannot tell. Jesus used the very methods they were using upon him. If these Jewish leaders could not determine who God's true servants were, then they will not accept Jesus' answer of where his authority comes from. Isn't that so amazing how Jesus could just turn that around? Like you just want to have that kind of like um, skill, right? Um, but I think it is the spirit. <sighs> like how could he discern besides the fact that he's a God? How could he discern what other people were trying to do? Well, the spirit would help us discern uh, what others are trying to do to us. Right. And then in turn, we could use the knowledge that the spirit is trying to communicate to us and then use it to our advantage. Right. The Lord promises us that he will consecrate all of our afflictions for our gain. And so um, it's something that he can do for us. Now, sometimes he consecrates our afflictions for our gain at the time that we are having that affliction. But sometimes he con consecrates our afflictions for our gain later on right and so then it it's not as uh live and the way that this that this interaction happened right but it's funny i think as a mom i get a lot of these uh <laughs> a lot of these things like like that insight that your that your child is trying to lie to you which uh, honestly sometimes i wish i didn't know that my child was trying to lie to me and actually there are times where i know that they're lying to me and i just choose to pretend like you know okay like I know that they're lying but what are, like I pick my battles you know and this last week um our oldest son I was cleaning out his room because sometimes moms just have to intervene you know what I'm saying I mean how many times do we tell him to clean the room and then how many times is it not clean anyway so I cleaned his room really good anyway I was in this like little bag thing it's like a holder that goes over his bed post so that he can have stuff because he doesn't really have a nightstand so it's kind of acts like like a little place to put stuff anyway so he has so many candy wrappers in there you will not even believe like I should have kept it so that I could show you but there were <laughs> so many candy I was just like pulling stuff I was like this has to be all of it nope it just kept coming out anyway so when I uh talked to my son about it 
I was like, so you had a bunch of candy wrappers, which, you know, bless this poor kid. He tries so hard not to eat candy because he plays sports. And so he knows that candy is not good for our bodies to perform at their peak. And anyway, like any child, okay, they are all going to want to eat candy. And it's a, it's a struggle to try to get our, it's such a struggle for me to try to get myself not to eat chocolate and sugar. So I can totally understand how it would be really hard for him anyway. So, um, <laughs> so he just sneaks it. And I think maybe he thinks that it's fine. He says to me, he goes, I hope I can say it the way he said it to me. He said, Mom, don't worry. All those rappers have been saved there over a period of 12 months. And I empty it once a month. <laughs> I, was, I was dying. He was like dead serious when he was telling me this. <laughs> I was like, you've got to be kidding. I'm like, literally, you just said that you empty it once a month. Really what he means to say is, I eat a year's worth of candy in one month and then I empty it once a month. That's what he meant to say. <laughs> anyway, that, it just like, that was just kind of one of those things that reminds me of like this situation. Like, <laughs> like was there anyone laughing at these Jewish leaders? Like, or was anybody in the background like, ding! uh christ just told them what's up like they couldn't even answer you know like was there anybody in the background like this because i would have loved to be that person you know in heaven when we were watching all this go down we were all like he told them you know like that was brilliant how did he know to say that like that you know like i don't know like i was just i like Sometimes I'm just like, Jesus is the best and he knows the best comebacks and stuff. But then there are those times where you're just like, Jesus could have totally took them and he doesn't. And he doesn't. <laughs> and so there's those times when you know you need to. And then there's those times where he shows that, that restraint. And it's like amazing, right? Because we're all like, dude, we would have, we would have knocked those people out. Anyway, so I think that's great. Okay. And then there's the parable of the two sons. <clears throat> so 28 to 32. So it says, but what think ye, a certain man had two sons and he came to the first and said, son, go work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. But afterward he repented and went and he came to the second and said, likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir, and went not. <laughs> it's like teenagers, you know, and you're like, hey, will you go do this? No. Right. But then they go like that's <laughs> that's that's mostly what happens with my kids no i don't want to and then they're like fine i'll go do it right and then there's the times when they're like yes i'll go and then they get adhd something distracts them some so many things distract them and they completely forgot what they were supposed to do um so it says which two whether of them twain did the will of his father they say unto him, the first, Jesus saith unto them, verily I say unto you that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came unto you in the way of righteousness and ye, were, and ye believed him not, but the publicans and the harlots believed him and ye, when ye had seen it, repented not afterward that ye might believe him. Okay, so there's that dramatic pause that I added because I'm like, what? I need to read that again. <laughs> but instead, I'm just going to read what the synopsis is because I think that sometimes that helps. Um, actually, all the time that helps, right? So it says, Jesus follows, or the, with the parable, follows with the parable of the two sons. The parable will show these chief priests and elders what hypocrites they are. A certain man... God has two sons. The man goes to his first son and asks him to work in his vineyard. The first, son first son's response was to defy the command. He does not pretend to do what is right, but refuses the request like a sinner might. <laughs> then later he regrets his choice and then chooses to do as his father asked and went to work in the vineyard. The second son is as the scribes, Pharisees, chief priests, and elders. He tells his father he will go and work in the vineyard but does not go. These are they who say they will go do they will do 
as God commands, and they even go through the outward motions to be seen of man, but they are hypocrites in their hearts. Jesus then asks, which one did as their father wished? To which of the chief priests an elder replied, the first. Then Jesus offers the burning conclusion. The publicans and harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. Why? Because John came to them in righteousness, which means God appointed him. They were invited into the vineyard, but they did not go. But many publicans and harlots did hear and did come. Okay, see, now that makes so much more sense. And this totally goes with this other thing for my kids, where they say they're not going to go do something. And eventually, then they go do it. And it's just like a way of parenting, you know? I think it's, I think it's, like, it's exhausting when my kids are like, no, mom, I'm not doing that. You know, and then you're like, okay, fine, like, fine, you're not going to do it, whatever. Uh, and then you try to give them like all the reasons they need to do it. And then you give them like all the reasons, uh, the benefits of doing it. And then the consequences of not doing it. And then, you know, you add some maybe uh, righteous uh, exchanges and hopefully that they'll figure things out. Right. And then eventually they do it. And then you're just like, well, why didn't they just do it in the first place? Like, why didn't they just say like, sure. But I guess they just, I think sometimes we just feel like we need to be the ones in control or we need to be the ones with the idea first and not other people, which is totally prideful, of course. <laughs> but it's one of the things that is in our nature. It's just like the human, humanness of us requires us to reject all the good things that <laughs> that come our way and then eventually we're like oh yeah and then we see the light right so um so anyway but then he talks about those kids who do say yeah i'll go do it and then like they just say whatever we want to hear instead of actually doing the thing that we ask them to do and so it makes sense that the first group will be saved because they actually did go and do after they had their internal struggle, right? Like you have to have that struggle with the spirit where you're just like, no spirit, I'm not going to go do it. And then the spirit's trying to tell you like, mm, it would be a great idea. It would been a bless your life like this. And it would help you this way. And you know, all those things and every, and we know that every good thing comes from God. And so you're just like, ah, you know, you have this internal struggle of like doing the good thing and doing not the good thing. Um, and, I have to go pick up my kid from school, but let me tell you my, a really quick example. One time, um, the spirit, so we were walking in Walmart or we were walking into Walmart. It was my son and I, and I saw this guy who was in our ward, this brother, and he had recently gotten divorced or maybe not recently, maybe it had been a couple years. Anyway, the spirit told me you should, you, you should say hi to him. He really needs somebody to say hi to him from, from you know somebody that knows him right and i'm like what no that's gonna be awkward what am i gonna say like how's your divorce going how did how lonely is it for you like it sucks to, that you had to get divorced <laughs> i just i honestly was like not knowing what to say i was like how am i supposed to you know and i was hoping the spirit would like tell me what to say right then because then i could like like say hi but this the this man was passing and so i was like passing with him like this literally next to him like this, it was crazy, okay? I'm pretty sure he noticed me, right? Pretty sure, but, and I for sure noticed him, but he was like looking down anyway, and um, so then I started looking down because I was like, I don't know what to say to this guy, right? So anyway, we both passed like this, and the second I passed him, it was like fire, like I was being burned, like I felt so bad. Immediately, I started crying. <laughs> and just thinking about it brings me back to that moment when I didn't do what the Holy Ghost told me to do. And I missed out on that opportunity to say hi to that good brother and who was probably struggling and just needed somebody to say hi. Like, I probably didn't even have to say anything else except like, hey, how you doing? And he could have been like, hey, you know, and that would have been it, right? Like, I, I probably didn't have to say anything else. But I was so worried about what, he would think that I was trying to say, right? That he would interpret my message in the wrong way. And anyway, like, um, 
I, I couldn't stop thinking about it. And I couldn't stop feeling really awful. And so I decided, you know what? I'm not even gonna go to Walmart. I turned around, I went home, and I made cookies. And we made chocolate chip cookies, they're our favorite always. And I was like, well, hopefully he likes chocolate chip cookies. And I knew he was living with his sons. And so I was like, and we'll make enough for him to share with the boys. And um, anyway, I took it over to him and I basically told him exactly what I just told you. I told him that the spirit told me to say hi and I didn't and I felt awful and that these were cookies for them to apologize for him to apologize to him for not saying hello and hoping that he will forgive me for not listening to a prompting and that he would um and that he will know that the lord was thinking about him and and that that he might have needed that and you know and i said if you like cookies you know great whatever i just i needed to do these now notice how i had a lot more work to do to make myself feel better about not acting on the Spirit's prompting. And had I acted on the Spirit's prompting, I would have saved myself like hours of work. And I think the Lord knows where we are at in our lives and puts people in our path that we can bless without extra effort on our part but with the perfect amount of like strategic placement that the Lord works his magic in. And if you take advantage of those strategically placed um, service opportunities, then you won't feel like you have to go out of your way for two hours to go make one person a batch of cookies. And that is... <laughs> That's my lesson that I learned that day. And so, yeah, <laughs> just go and do the thing that the Lord commands us to do, right? Because in the end, we're going to be blessed. Um, if you want to put all of that effort into it, great. You can learn the lesson that way too. But <laughs> he promises <laughs> to make our life easier, not harder. But we're the ones that when we say no, when we say, I'm not going to go do that then we're making our life harder and we just don't realize it. Um, so anyways, um, I wanted to read the read it, live it for today because they have, um, they're, they want us to read the living Christ this week. And I think that's a great idea. I think we're going to do that for Wednesday. So tomorrow, um, and part one, it, it says the living Christ contains the testimony of the reality and matchless life of Jesus Christ. The apostles remind us that none other has had a, so profound an influence upon all who have lived. How has he, Jesus Christ, had a profound influence upon you? Mm. So powerful. Love it. Um, okay. So until tomorrow. Oh, you know, <laughs> uh, somebody commented on one of our one of my uh one of my videos and i i wanted to say stay strong warrior but i want to remind you that it, i don't say stay strong to try and like add some kind of like fake pretending um but i want when i say stay strong oh good job when i say stay strong i'm i'm talking about stay strong in your testimony of jesus christ um, but it's okay to cry and it's okay to be weak and it's okay to feel sad and it's okay to, to not feel strong sometimes is what they said. And I, I appreciate that because it is true. We sometimes don't feel strong, but we can still have that faith in Jesus Christ. In fact, sometimes like it's in our weakness that we seek out the savior the most. And, um, that is how, uh, that is where who we need to stay strong, uh, t strongly tied to is our Savior Jesus Christ, and and that that is how we stay strong, and that is uh, that's what I mean. So if you felt like I was trying to make you something that you're not or whatever, um, that was not my intention, and I want you to know that I know what it's like to feel sad and weak and torn down, and um, but uh, that when we do 
stay strongly tied to the Savior, that we can overcome all things because that is his promise. And um, until tomorrow, stay strong, warrior.